I'm Stuart Brand from Long Now, and my wife and I live in the houseboat community in Sausalito on a tugboat, which we think is pretty salty. <laughs> Yesterday, a voice came from the water, and it was tonight's speaker swimming by from her houseboat three docks over. Uh, I also just learned that she swam the Escape from Alcatraz race this June, and that is salty. <laughs> A lot more than we can do. She's been basically bringing machines closer to our senses, closer to our mind for years, and now she's swimming upstream to bring machines <laughs> a lot closer to our brains. Mary Lou Jepson. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, no pressure, Stuart Brand gave me a title for this talk and I had to figure out the rest. So uh, towards practical telepathy. Because it's, I think, a really important moment to understand what's happening in brain-computer communications. The fidelity is getting much better, much faster than I think a lot of you in the room may appreciate. And so, uh, with this lofty title, <laughs> let me take a dive in trying to explain to you uh, where we're going and why I think it's important to talk about it now. So. I believe using the tools of our time, telepathy is in reach right now. And the tools of our time are big data, machine learning, and the often neglected trillion dollar manufacturing infrastructure that makes today's consumer electronics, which is where I've been living and breathing for the last three decades, shipping billions of dollars worth of them. And the fidelity is going up, and I think that um, you're going you're gonna to learn a lot from this, but I want to start with something. Some of you might be thinking, why is this not Theranos? Why are we not a fraud? <laughs> Seriously, you might not want to say it, but you might be thinking, yeah, sure, telepathy came to the talk, but yeah, sure. And so let's just start there, okay? I've spent my entire life working on this technology, three decades, and I and my team and my investors will not ship a product before its time, but we believe what we're inventing and creating can save countless lives and transform the lives of the living in a very positive way, which is why we're doing it. But we are not interested in the saccharine, extrinsic results of a hyper-connected board shipping product before it's ready or the valuation of the company. We're in it to do it, and I just want to start there. So, um, thanks. Uh, so, you know, when I was a teenager, I fell in love with holography. This is very similar to the first hologram I made. I actually couldn't find it. But I went on and on from there. And the reason I mentioned that is because I believe holography is one of the three keys to enable us to have a high resolution brain computer interface. And so I spent the next decade of my career trying to make holograms not in film, but electroholography. And with a team of graduate students, somehow I found myself as, at MIT as a graduate student, we built the world's first fully holographic video system, all, all of us together. Um, and I kept going with that, and, and this holographic video system is the crux of what we're using to see inside of our bodies and brains, upgraded 30-some-odd 30, 30 years later. And so people talk about a world of screens, and it's just strange because I come from a world of screens, but I actually, like, I literally, like, design the screens, like the liquid crystals, the transistors, the drive schemes, um, the devices they go into, the hardware, the software, uh, every, every part of the system. And I've been doing that with all kinds of novel screen technologies for my whole adult life, from virtual reality to projection systems to HDTVs to wristwatch videos to all kinds of different 3D systems over the years. And, um, 
One example of this, and, and one of the reasons I have some confidence to think that I can do what we're talking about tonight, is some work that I did when I was a professor at MIT, and I started a not-for-profit with my much more famous co-founder, Nicholas Negroponte, pictured here with uh, Kof, the, the late Kofi Annan when he was head of the United Nations. And so we decided that if we could make a $100 laptop, we could lower the cost of the laptop so much we could get it en masse to children in the developing world who lacked um, really good, good teachers and a lot of um, lacked access to education. Basically, we throw away half the children that are born in the world in that they don't get really access to a good education. So the titans of industry thought we were nuts. We got thrown out of MIT for doing it. They did say, you know, look, get it out of your system first, then come back. It just looks a lot like a startup. They knew it was a not-for-profit. But, you know, we did it. We made a $100 laptop, made a not-for-profit with a few billion dollars of revenue, catalyzed $30 billion of revenue for our for-profit partners, became the fastest-growing consumer electronic category ever recorded, and, oh yeah, transformed the lives of hundreds, 100 million children in the developing world. And at that point, I just sort of thought, you know, there aren't enough MIT professors sleeping on the factory floors of the world to design really innovative things that can ship. Like universities ship students and papers, but if you want to ship something, you have to work with the infrastructure. So I moved to Asia. And so this is like the factories that I've lived and breathed in. This is final assembly, when you take all the components you've developed and bring them together. I also work a lot in the factories that make different chips and components and so forth to design that to get that functionality. So um, what else can you make with these things? I, as I mentioned, I left MIT and I did a startup and, and then Sergey Brin kind of aqua hired me and my startup and I went to Google and I thought, you know, wow. What if everybody could have a million dollar view or a shared screen to uh, see and interact with their family in a different time zone? Wouldn't that be cool? And how would you do that? And I can't actually say what I did at Google, um, but I can write what patents are. And so basically LCDs, liquid crystal displays, are like $20 a square foot. And I figured out how to architect the liquor crystal display is such that you could just tile screens together and not see any boundaries between them. And then put uh, a 3D into it so things would be at infinity. So you could all, you know, have the view of the beach or the mountain or the Eiffel Tower or what, whatever you wanted. And, or, or, your, or your family in a different place. Um, from there, I, I went to Oculus and this is sort of the last trip um, because a few years ago, about five years ago, virtual reality and augmented reality got hot again, and I had a lot of experience in VR, AR 1.0. And uh, this is still like a face box, uh, uh, sorry, a face mask or a shoe box on your head, and that seems um, kind of large. So again, I can't say <laughs> what I did at Oculus and Facebook, because that's secret, but... Um, Obviously, you want, you know, there's one thing that's acceptable to wear on your face and it better look like glasses or it's not going to have widespread acceptance. And so I figured out how to make a, an AR, well, I wrote a patent <laughs> at Oculus owns, I lots of patents actually. I have like more than 200 patents in the last, I haven't counted in a long time, but like a few years ago I counted. So I, I invent a lot and, and ship the inventions, um, which is how I publish. And so this looks like a light-filled display. It's not. I use the old seamlessly tileable trick from my Google days on the back of your retina, and that enabled a VR AR system that toggles with the right resolution, with virgins control, and a lot of the things that you hear about with VR and AR as issues, which are totally solvable. But at that time, I and my colleagues at Apple and Google and, and Microsoft and Sony and Magic Leap and so forth were able to pull off something I thought was more interesting. We were able to put manufacturing process improvements into this trillion dollar manufacturing supply chain at the sort of bottom of it. I sort of think of it as like this trickle down of Moore's law hitting the lowly factories that I've lived and breathed in, in the LCD fabs, liquid crystal display fabs, and camera chip fabs. And the discontinuity of Moore's law, the, the idea that Gordon Moore, the founder of Intel, said transistor density will double every 18 months, and that's been true for 50 years or, or more. Um, 
really had a big impact and a discontinuity in the physics as the pixel size approached the wavelength of light. And that's why I mentioned the holography in the beginning. You can record a hologram if your pixel size is approximately the wavelength of light. Every single one of you in this room that has a smartphone has camera chip in it with one micron pixels, which is the wavelength of light in the near infrared, and your body is translucent to the near infrared. The visible is a little bit shorter wavelength. And I thought, you know, this is just too big of an idea not to quit my job, <laughs> my cushy job at Facebook, and try to figure out if I could make a system that could see in high resolution inside of our bodies and brains. So that was two and a half years ago. I quit and um, started Open Water. Actually, uh, a, f a mutual friend of ours, uh, Peter Gabriel, the, the, the musician, rock star, human rights activist, I think he called me like every week for like six months trying to convince me to quit to do this outside of Facebook. So anyway, ultimately, he named the company Open Water. Um, I actually didn't swim open water, I just started swimming open water because I thought it would be pretty funny for um, somebody that has a company called Open Water to swim open water because it would just be really confusing. So I've, I, I, found it, I found it enjoyable. But the goal, what we're trying to do is to take this big iron machine, this big MRI machine, and reduce it into a consumer electronics wearable. And that can transform medical imaging, and it can also transform the way we communicate with each other via brain. And, and let me take you on this journey and explain to you why I think so. I believe that we can put the functionality of that MRI system into a wearable, into a ski hat or a bandage or a bra or many different things that gives not just MRI resolution, but read-write and higher resolution at massively lower cost, not just in 10x lower cost, like with one laptop per child, but at scale, 1,000 times cheaper, which can be really transformative. And so why does that dovetail, not just with medical imaging, but understanding our brains? Because our brains are part of our body, so if we can see inside of our body, we can see inside of our brains. And there's a lot of great work that I'm gonna share with you tonight by these amazing neuroscientists using functional magnetic resonance imaging scanners. Those are like the video form of MRI, showing all kinds of things that we can communicate by just lying inside of, of these machines. So the National Academies have said of the top five, of most, the National Academies of most developed countries have said of the top five things you can do as a technologist, reverse engineering the brain is one of those things. And so, the question is, you know, how do you do that? So in the last two and a half years, I'm not a neuroscientist. I've talked to a lot of neuroscientists. Any neuroscientist worth their salt will tell you, we don't even know what a thought is. I'm like, well, you know, it's sort of like pornography. You know it when you see it, but we don't know what it is. And this whole issue boils down to something they call causal versus non-causal. You have about 100 billion neurons in your brain, each of them with 100,000 possible connections. And the, it just seems intractable to track that. And that's just the neurons, let alone the glia and whatever's happening in your gut and the hormones and all of this stuff going on. And then there's the non-causal approach, where you just do a, a top-down approach, which is really, I think, what's happened with some of the, both the implant solutions and the fMRI solutions. And so I think that there's this context that, that you know, the bottoms-up approach is pretty cool, but the top-down approach is also pretty cool, and hopefully we meet in the middle. And so I want to talk to you about a little bit about what's been done with fMRI. In 1991, I got the cover of Science, uh, a group at Harvard Mass General Hospital was able to show that the blood flow of your brain, as measured in an fMRI machine, could show whether you were looking at an image or not. First thing, amazing. Oh my gosh, can we use fMRI to see thoughts? Well, if we fast forward a number of years later, I became aware of this work. This is the work of Professor Jack Gallant at, at University of California at Berkeley. And he started working with lab rats and then macaques and then moved up to using graduate students as lab rats <laughs> and put them in MRI scanners for hundreds of hours and made them watch YouTube videos where recordings were made of their minds lighting up or not lighting up, area by area, 
what fMRI measures is oxygen use by looking at the color change or the change of blood properties, whether it's carrying oxygen or not under a, two, two, under a huge magnetic field. And by looking at, at that and creating a library, if you will, of students reacting to hundreds of hours of YouTube videos, um, then a new clip was shown called the presented clip here. And the computer, using the scan data, inferred what it thought the student was looking at. And the result is a grainy image of what the student was looking at. And I saw this and I'm like, oh my gosh. We just have to lower the, the size of the device and up the resolution, and, and there you go. And I tried, <laughs> I tried to get Google to fund this. I tried to get Facebook. But anyway, I am doing it now. I'm a startup. So it's been a long haul. Um, and uh, you know, also, there's this Japanese group who went even further. They put the graduate students in the MRI machines and woke the students up a couple of minutes after they fell asleep Ask them what they were dreaming about to make a video of your dreams so that you can dump your dreams in an MRI scanner to the computer. It's totally cool. This is um, back to uh, UC Berkeley, and um, with less than 5% um, false positive threshold, by looking at an area or a signature of your brain, we can predict a word cloud of words you're thinking, in this case, numbers. In another case, um, there's, a, there's a violence area, a sex and violence area, so you could actually in the future imagine turning that filter down if you didn't wish to communicate thoughts of sex and violence now that you know, you're hooking your brains up with each other. So this is pretty cool stuff. And um, there's, there's some work done. This work is uh, a decade ago. This is just a very fast path through fMRI. Uh, where uh, the students were shown a thousand images, and the computer could, if the students were shown each of the thousand images just twice, with 80% accuracy, the fMRI machine and the computer could decide, or guess, or infer what the student, what student, what the images the student was looking at. And just to be clear, through random guess with a thousand images, that's a 0.1% chance of happening. This is pretty stunning how accurate you can get in certain control in certain situations just using fMRI. So then there's a lot of work that's gone on with, with brain implants. And it's got to be pretty tough for you to have the brain implant. Um, has anybody ever had um, brain surgery in the room? I have. Okay. So, I'm the only startup doing brain-computer communication that's not doing impl implants. I had a non-elective brain surgery in 1995 to stay alive. I take a dozen medications every day to live. You're going to do that if it's that or death. But I just don't see a billion people having elective brain surgery anytime soon. It's the hardest thing I ever did in my life. But yet, you know, here's a case at Brown University, my alma mater, where a woman was a paraplegic. They gave her an implant, and for the first time, she could give herself a drink with a robot arm. Totally cool. So if you've got a condition where, you can't, where you're locked in or you can't move, I totally see it. There's been this amazing work done with electrode probes where 500 neurons were activated in this, in this primate, and with those 500 neurons activating the, with the electrical pulses, the primate could play the video game and do pretty well. And then they, they, gave, they, they hooked three primates together, each with 500 neuro, 500 electrodes. And the three primates played the video games a lot better, <laughs> which is really kind of interesting if you think of where that, where that might lead, with sharing our minds. And so the bet we're making, I'm making, is that the massively more data we enable by putting a, a, a two-ton magnet that's the most expensive room in the hospital that costs a few million dollars, that has liquid helium to cool it and a power plant to run it, and the magnetic shielding and no metal and all of that, if we put that into a wearable, we can get massively more data. Um, higher resolution, uh, which I'm going to talk about how, with better temporal response. And we also have found, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, non-invasive, actually direct neuron read-write, and uh, better hierarchical uh, algorithms that we think we can develop with this. Non-causally, sort of top-down, meeting the bottom-up people who are saying, we don't know what a thought is, there's 100 billion neurons, each with 100,000 different connections. We hear you, we also think it's important to come top down. So, we're replacing that big, 
honking, literally big iron machine with a wearable. And for the first year and a half, I convinced my investors to just, you know, let's not focus on product, let's just look at the limits of the physics. Can we hit the resolution of fMRI, which is about 10 cubic millimeters? And then could we get to one millimeter, which is about the resolution of non-video MRI? We did that, we did that. And we found the limit was at a couple of microns. We could focus through skull and brain, simulated optically mimicking phantom of skull and brain, to a few microns. Which is, it sounds like a thousand times better. It's a, like about a, a five thousandths of a millimeter. But that's actually an X, Y, and Z. So that's a thousand times a thousand times a thousand or a billion times higher resolution than MRI that our core technology is capable of. And if we combine that with work that's been done with neurons, we can see the optical changes in neurons before uh, an electrical pulse proceeds down the axon in a neuron. That's because the ionic channels change and it causes the membranes to roughen. And when they roughen, they scatter, and we can see a difference from that. And it's also been shown that you can use near-infrared light to write the state of the neuron without even optogenetics. There's also the combination of the great work of optogenetics where you add a, a, a tag to a neuron where you can optically excite it. So we think that we could get a lot more information. And so then we get to this question, and it's a yes-no question. Do we or don't we want to understand the brain? And you could say, no, we don't want to. I've had a lot of people argue with me, and I'm just like, well, really? You know, the National Academies of most developed countries have said, as I said earlier, that this is one of the things you can do as a technologist to really transform. But we could decide we do not want to understand our brains or any other brains on the planet at all. It feels like burying your head in the sand. We might be too scared of it. But ultimately, I can't imagine how we don't want to do it. And so, on some level, we're really all Stephen Hawking in that the input to our brains are pretty good. The eyes and ears have pretty high bandwidth. But what comes out? You know, we move our tongues and speak or type. I mean, if I was a good dancer, maybe I could communicate, but I'm, I'm not. And, you know, we're stuck with language. And what if we could dump the images, the raw emotion, the memories, the layers of music directly out of our brains into each other? What could we do then, is a the question. And then the flip side is, you know, can we handle it? This is the classic Star Trek, the first generation. Spock was this guy who was half human and half... It was called Vulcan, it was very logical. And he'd get in these mind melds where he was the only guy that could mind meld, but he was just, he'd fall in a heap afterwards and not be able to work for three days because all of the emotion was just way too much for him. And so I wonder how we will be able to handle it as we are able to share these thoughts. And we're going to talk a little bit about the ethics of that. So where are we today? I've explained a little bit about that, and where can we get in 10, 20, 30 years is really a question. And, and I might be um, more uh, pro um, that this can happen faster than some of you, but pick a year. It's going to happen. In 10 to 20 years, I think we'll see language decline, and our ability to share audio and visual fluency increase, and emotional... Um, understanding of each other should increase with our ability to share this, the thoughts and memories that we wish, that give us this great joy that we wish to share with people. And then we become somewhat transparent. It's, it's this last bastion of privacy, and how do we handle being able to see each other's thoughts and dreams? So even if you think, no way, 10, 20 years, like, this is the long now, like, pick a year, like, <laughs> before the clock runs out or out, you know, like, it's going to happen. It's inevitable. And, you know, the big opportunity really might be ego and bullying and biases and power trips and stuff like that, <laughs> because we can see through it, hopefully. So I think that as we think about connecting ourselves with high bandwidth, it's perhaps inevitable that we will only exist as part of a collective. And what does that look like, and how do we walk into that? The Native Americans have had this vision of making decisions based on what would happen seven generations from now. But we're living at a time where in seven generations, 
will any of us alive today recognize, if we could live that long, that as humanity, with all of the changes in biotechnology in front of us right now, and maybe that's the wrong question anyway, isn't humanity kind of discriminatory? We're not the only living things on Earth, and isn't it the life cycle, and don't we care more about that as we become more connected to each other? So that's the vision. So, you know, what do we want? This is San Francisco, so <laughs> peace, love, and understanding. But, you know, what do we got? You know, we've got, you know, power, control, ambition, ego. And how does that switch or change as our brains come online with each other? So do we use it to empower leaders or do we even need leaders? Can we communicate without them? You know, these are, these are questions that we need to think about. But, you know, we have gotten better. You know, if you think, pick a year, 1,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, it really was might makes right. And, uh, you know, now we have laws that, you know, murder is a crime and stuff like that. So it's, it's much better. But maybe the big, the really big thing that we should be doing is working on, you know, the innovative solutions to big problems with really big impact. And that's the most valuable thing in the world. And by putting our brains together, we should surely be able to solve these better if we could do that effectively. And so the world, they say, is only changed with small groups. What if we could make the groups bigger without losing bandwidth, like we do now? And could, what could we do then? And it, it said, you know, primates, only have, uh, have three times less connections outside of their family group than humans. And that study was done before social media. And yes, there are parallels and learnings we can have from social media here. Um, another thought I had is I was listening recently to an interview the fabulous Rob Reed did with Martin Rees, which I'd highly recommend. And in it, Martin Rees said, you know, Darwinism was the survival of the fittest, obviously, but characterized by two things intelligence and aggression together survive. And as we connect our minds more together, does connectivity trump, sorry for the word, <laughs> aggression? And that's the opportunity or the, the lack of one. So, to open water and what we're doing, um, consumer electronics, big data, machine learning, this is some of what can happen with it. I did a startup because universities, well, I got thrown out for shipping stuff. Like, universities ship students and papers. Anything else is a product. You can't do it. I want to do it at scale. I use the trillion dollar manufacturing infrastructure of Asia, which means I have to ship. Big companies, the big powerful companies, are really the ones that today are, are really known for optimizing click revenue for ad sales, and they're really good at it and made everybody a lot of money. But the decisions are made by people that are really good at that and web services, and so things on the fringes tend to require a semi, almost unanimous uh, decision by the, the stakeholders, and there's a lot of politics, I mean, sort of the, the lust for power and control that gets in the way, and startups are just so simple. You just go down to Sand Hill Road, somebody gives you money, there's more money for startups than ever before in recorded history, and then you just execute, and you show what you've got, and somebody else gives you more money, and it just seems like a simpler structure to get going that's just faster and more efficient. So we're trying to use a startup structure to do the innovator's dilemma, classic Clayton Christensen that says, you know, honestly, those big MRI machines haven't improved much in 30 years, and the um, trickle-down of Moore's Law hitting these camera chip fabs just seemed like a really important opportunity to explore. And so I'm going to show you a little bit about how this works over here, because we use basically red light to see inside of our bodies and brains. And... Um, yeah, I've got a little setup here. So if we can turn down the lights for a sec. I just want to show, maybe I'll go over here. Um, our red light goes right through my hand and my body. So does x-rays, so do gamma rays, so does a two-ton magnet. But guess which one's cheaper? <laughs> By a lot. So um, special for the long now, my husband and I, um, found a place with brains yesterday, um, pig brains. So I have a trigger warning. Is anybody a vegetarian? 
No, seriously. <laughs> um, yeah, so, yeah, so I got brains because I wanted to show you, since we're talking about brains and it's Halloween. Um, <laughs> so this was Petaluma yesterday. And I was really surprised. So this is, um, this is a brain, and this is, this is two pigs' brains. Um, and I've got some more back here. But I implanted a tumor backstage. Can everybody see the tumor in the pig's brain? <laughs> it's the dark spot. So what this shows is that you can see tumors with just red light. But I have some more brain here. And if I put it on top, <laughs> I'm just spreading it out. It's really. Um, <laughs> Uh, you, can, you can no longer see the tumor, and it just, the light scatters everywhere, and, um, and in order to be able to see uh, the tumor, we have to figure out a way to de-scatter the light, and the key to doing that, and why I mentioned holography, oops, is, is, is holography. It enables us to record the intensity of the light, the phase of the light, light's a wave, at every angle simultaneously, including at every angle of the scattering of the brain or the body. And so we use that, and a third key, ultrasonic pings um, that are now, we can make in chips. And so this, this picture of this head, this, these three discs represent the camera chips and ultrasonic chips and light that we're making the new kinds of lasers that we're making. And from one of these d discs that represents the ultrasonic chip and the camera chip, an ultrasonic ping emerges and focuses down to a spot. Then I'm gonna let the light in, and you're probably wondering, well, oh, why the light later? And it's like, it's a very simple reason when you, when you hear it, the speed of sound is slower than the speed of light. And so we want them to end up at the same place at the same time. So we bring in the light, it scatters everywhere, like the brain or like, um, through my hand, and uh, the light that goes through that focus of the ultrasonic ping changes color ever so slightly, just like the pitch of a police car siren changes as it speeds past you. It Doppler shifts. And so we exploit another property of holography, which is only two beams of exactly the same color light can record a hologram and interference fringes, which is really what a, a one beam can't record a hologram. You need to beat two beams across each other. And that creates this fringe structure, which we decode. And we decode that fringe structure, much like Rosalind Franklin decoded this iconic image of X-ray diffraction to reveal the structure of DNA for the first time. But we can do that at a million times a second because uh, we're using camera chips and electronics and not film and so forth. And so then we take another, another um, black disc and focus another ping down. And in fact, using this principle, we can scan out spot by spot, voxel by voxel, a 3D pixel of the brain, raster scanning row by row or randomly in different ways or focusing on areas of interest. We can do it with large foci or small foci. And this enables us to scan both the brain and our body. So you're probably thinking, what about skull and, and bones? And so this is, this, is, this is real human skull that someone on my team got at skullsunlimited.com. <laughs> yeah. I know, we have fun in the lab. Um, so uh, this is just red light, goes right through. Those of you who are in optics know, um, you know, black absorbs light, white scatters it, so it just scatters. And so we use that, and with that, we've taken phantoms like this, where we implant tumors, and we can find the tumors, the vasculature that has, this has the same optical properties as flesh, and we're able to find things with the same optical properties as tumors and vasculature and so forth. And so we've been doing a lot of that. We used to use whatever was on sale in the meat market and um, some of the team protested because the lab started to stink a lot after we run a scan overnight. So anyway, we're um, finding different tumors and this is super key. Um, here's um, a, a flask of blood, um, which you can see. And What's really interesting is red light 
the blood is absorbed. The, the, the blood absorbs the red light. And if I compare that to my pound of flesh here, it scatters it. So you can see the difference of that, and so can our camera chips. And that's super important when we think about our bodies, because any tumor bigger than a millimeter or two in size steals blood and grows vasculature, so it can grow and try to kill you. So tumors have five times the amount of blood as normal tissue. So that's a top killer, cancer. Cardiovascular disease. We're really good at seeing where blood isn't, like in clogs in your heart or veins or so forth. And, really importantly, the color change blood makes, whether it's carrying oxygen or not carrying oxygen, which is exactly what fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, does, which is where I showed you in the beginning, throwing graduate students into those machines, we could read their dreams, their, the images in their head, the words they were thinking of, and so forth. So we can do that, literally, with camera chips, a laser, and ultrasonic pings, in, in the form of a wearable. So this is a mock-up of what our system can look like, and you can wear it here, around your head, different things. Um, we're building, we also might go with a wand kind of system. You know, we're working on different, different um, form factors for that. But the physics is pretty solid. There's also something with, with fMRI. It often takes four seconds to see um, the, the, the use, what we're looking at is where oxygen is used in your brain, as I mentioned. And that's basically the blood flowing by, the oxygen gets pulled off, and then it's, they call it deoxygenated. No more oxygen in the blood. But there's a dip that happens first, so we should be able to see a sub-second response. We're also looking at neurons, as I mentioned, which move at a millisecond kind of time frame. And so we're combining all of these to see what kinds of, of systems we can build. So last winter, spring, we had this big lab rig setup where I was able, we were able, I, I work with this fantastic team. I'm up here tonight, but I really, you know, the work of all of the team that I work with is, is astonishing. Best team I've ever had the, had, the, had the joy to work with. We built this system, and um, we built it because before you, as a chip designer, when you, when you design chips, you need to spend millions of dollars to get access to the fabs, and if you don't ship those chips, in short order after designing them, you're thrown out of that lab. And so what you do is you jerry-rig whatever you can using existing chips so you can ch test every aspect of your design with a big rig first and make sure your system will do what you think it does. So we spent two and a half years doing that. And now what we've done is we've um, collaborated and made um, uh, uh, these, these new components with partners, three new components, camera chips, ultrasonic chips, and new kinds of lasers. The camera chips I talked about, the one micron feature size is, is key. What happens is the light in, the infrared light that comes in is converted at 70% efficiency to electrons. That's up 10x in the last year alone, and that's become standard in smartphones to do 3D sensing and um, for next generation augmented reality, so that you can play Pokemon Go, plus, plus. No, seriously, that's why a billion dollars was spent to do this, so that you could play Pokemon Go, plus, plus, and, and to unlock your phone um, by not you know, typing a password or, or, or you know, swiping a pattern. But I thought that maybe we could use it in a different way, so we are, and there, there's, it's also very good. Do you know how many lasers are in this generation iPhone? close to 500, because they put dot and line patterns on you to figure out what your face looks like. So we can just use that to enable telepathy and to massively lower the cost of medical imaging, which I thought might be more interesting. Um, and it's not like, look, I liked like shoot 'em up games when I was 15 too, and I worked with a lot of people at Oculus that still love them, but you know, I just, <laughs> it's fine. Because it's enabled us to get this technology available. And the ultrasonic chips, that really, I think, the first time that came into my consciousness was some work that Texas Instruments did in the early 90s to make screens, projectors, so that you could plug a laptop into a projector in a boardroom rather than printing out 
your slides. It used to be you'd have an overhead protector and what they called foils, which were pieces of plastic that were printed on, and you'd project your talk that way. And what Texas Instruments did was make um, pixels with little diving boards on each pixel that were electrostatically deflected. So that technology now, 30 years later, is enabling us to ultrasonically vibrate um, and focus with these chips that we can make in any fab that can steer around plus or minus 60 degrees to allow us to focus into the head and change the wavelength of the light. The other part, um, one of the reasons we've scanned mostly dead animals, whatever was on sale at the meat market, or optically mimicking phantoms, is because um, we're alive. It's good to be alive. That means we move. We breathe and blood moves through our veins. And that's the thing that we have to do a flash or a strobe faster than the blood moving through the, our veins. Although I'm friends with this professor in the Netherlands that has graduate students put tourniquets on their arms to stop the blood flow so that he can take images with normal lasers. But if you did that on your neck, it's called strangulation, and you know, that really won't work. So we did the hard thing. We made a pulse laser with the right, what's called coherence, very, very fine control of the color. So when we shift the color, only the shifted color interferes, not the unshifted. That's called coherence, and at the right wavelength, so we can pick up the color change in blood, whether it's oxygenated or not. So we've made those, and we... Um, also, uh, like in the last six months, we've lowered the amount of light we need by about 10x. We've increased the image quality as measured by the signal-to-noise ratio, which is a technical term, but basically, you want more signal, less noise, so that's good. Um, we've reduced the footprint down by about 100x, and we're about to, in this quarter, increase the scan speed by about 100x. And so the system in build out right now is in a small animal facility locally at a secret undisclosed location where we've actually slimmed it down to just a little ultrasonic array, the optical detector camera unit, and a little fiber optic probe that comes in on the rat. Total ethical approval to do this. All of our, stuffs are, all of our tests, are, tests are checked. And our goal this quarter, next quarter, is to MRI these little rats and then image them and make sure our images are the same or better than the MRIs. And then we'll get approval for human use. So this is super important, not just for telepathy. I keep mentioning, but it bears to mention again, two-thirds of humanity lacks access to medical imaging. It can be transformative to let us see and diagnose conditions earlier and treat them earlier. But everyone in this room say, well, that's you know, poor people. Well, it's true for rich people, too. We know MRI is a better diagnostic, about 10 times better for breast cancer. But do we use it for routine screening in the US? No. Does it used in any country in the world? No. What's the number one reason why? It's too expensive. So if we can lower the cost of it, then people worry about false positives. And it's like when the scan costs less than a dollar, you can scan all the time. You should be able to buy this thing in the drugstore and just scan. If you've got the BRCA gene, do you have to go all Angelie Jolie or could we make a bra where you really cut off part of your body and, you know, it's, it's serious stuff. Could we just look at, over time, the deltas? You care basically about three things. Is it getting bigger? Is it getting smaller? Is it staying the same size? If it's getting bigger, you might want to seek active care, but if it's something, you can just watch it, which is very different than what we have now with the cost structures involved. There's also a limit to how much gadolinium you can have, which is the contrast agent that's in injected for an MRI scan, and it's thought now to cause cancer, and people are trying to figure out if, what that means for lifetime scans. Obviously, with CT and PET, there's radiation there, so you're also limited. So then the other thing, the most expensive healthcare in the world is that for brain disease, which two billion people suffer from if you add up things like schizophrenia and depression and neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And this could do enormous good for that. Like, there's, there's a biological basis for brain disease. Right now, to diagnose depression, where the average person loses 12 years of work in their life that's clinically depressed, you answer these questions, like, have you gained weight? Are you sleeping all the time? Are you tired? Do you have thoughts of suicide? You answer to that yes to that and 50 other questions, you're clinically depressed. 
where studies have shown that actually the way your, the, what your brain looks like in MRI is an indicator of what kind of depression or if you have depression. And from that, you can see what the therapy does. Does this pill work to change that pattern or not? You can see that much more efficiency. You can close the loop. Precision psychology could be enabled through this. And then uh, Peter Gabriel, who I mentioned earlier, um, is, I just want to, like, as we sort of start to bring this together, we're doing imaging and also some, some writability that I'll talk about. If, but if we combine this with all the great work being done in genomics and blood, is there a way, um, Peter asked, and I think he's, he started and he's announced this thing that he started called the TAP, which is a way to think about, he talks about the music industry fundamentally changing when streaming music happened. A, music got cheaper, but B, everybody got access. And so how do we get everybody to have access? We probably do have enough doctors. They're not evenly distributed. There's three continents that lack enough doctors. And yet smartphones have happened and all of this stuff. So how do we sort out what that looks like? And I'm so glad he's taking it on. We're helping him every way we can. But one thing that, that didn't occur to me, um, the Focused Ultrasound Foundation, I was just there last week, um, helped me understand that the sonic pings where we're focusing down for a microsecond and then we shift the wavelength of light, if we just focus that for 15 seconds, we can do surgery without a knife. We can ablate tissue. We can open the blood-brain barrier. We can do neuromodulation. We can deliver drugs, sort of like microdosing, but the right dose at the right place and not getting the drug everywhere else by using drugs that are basically microencapsulated and the ultrasound bursts them. And so this is approved for essential tremor, for treatment of Parkinson's disease. The recovery rate, if you don't, guess what, if you don't cut up in your body and bleed out blood is much higher. And so it turns out that from where I sit, that's like, sorry, I'm an electrical engineer, that's a packaging problem if you want to put in that much power for 15 million times longer than we are, but it's at the same basic power density. So we're very excited about that. On FDA, um, we're in some informal discussions with them, but the predicate products that have existed using near-infrared light are for many decades as well as ultrasound. You are exposed to more infrared light today on the streets of San Francisco, even in the clouds, if you're in a foggy part, than you will be with our system, and the ultrasonic pings are well understood as well, so we don't anticipate much of a problem while we're walking through it. So what this can enable is the democratization of healthcare and telepathy, which brings me to not to do tonight in Stewart's title, because they're not separable. The same device can do both. The software layer is different, but the same device that sees inside of our bodies can see inside of our brains. And so in terms of the limits of speed, we can go up to 100,000 frames per second per unit and we can multiplex them, which is way faster than MRI, although our first units will be substantially slower as we walk through developing this. In terms of depth, we had gotten to six inches, but then we upped the laser power. It's really a function of a laser power. So if you think about an obese patient, um, the limits from the FDA are basically how much how much infrared per centimeter squared, and this might sound cruel, but an obese person has more surface area than a skinny. So you can basically irradiate, you can bring in more light and get more depth. So we think about a foot from any side. We're walking through that right now. Resolution, we can match fMRI, we can go smaller. We could even go, as we showed in the lab and live on stage at TED this year, we could get a few micron resolution. The blood time scale is about four seconds. We think we can bring that down to sub-second, looking at the dip, as I said, but there's also the neural time scale and how many neurons we scan over the course of milliseconds as they beep. Is it, they beep, they, they send electrical pulses. We think of them as, I think of them as sound. And, and we're not working on causality. Not all 100 billion neurons are saying we can come from a top-down approach and meet the bottom-up pe people. And it, it reminded me a lot as I was preparing this talk of, of talks I had with the amazing Paul Allen, co-founder of Microsoft, founder of the Allen Institute, who died 
too early a few weeks ago. And he always used to tell me I was nuts, which I always like talking to people that tell me that because I tend to learn something, especially somebody as smart as Paul. Such a great loss. But he would always say, you know, there's five Nobel Prizes just to understand how a neuron works. And I'd say, great, Paul, you guys go get those Nobel Prizes and we'll meet you halfway. And um, there's just this monoculture of neuroscience that you've got to understand the electrical pulses down then. I'm an electrical engineer, I get it, but there's all this stuff you can do with optics and physics. And in fact, that is what we're using for imaging systems. It's the physics breakthroughs that have enabled us to see through our bodies. So the best argument I heard, a friend sent me a paper, who shall remain nameless, um, saying, you know, what you're doing sounds like this is, again, the causal approach. Um, there was this classic paper written two years ago about, you know, the neuroscience approach could it work sort of decoding what was happening on a silicon microprocessor driving the game Donkey Kong? And could you like probe out the transistors and figure out how Donkey Kong worked? And they tried to probe them out and then they zapped a transistor at a time and the result was they couldn't figure it out. It just didn't work. It was a, it's a pretty cool paper. Um, but they do point out in this paper the brain is more modular. And so we still know, with 80% accuracy, what image you're looking at. With a 5% false negative, what kind of word cloud you're thinking of. Just from existing resolution of fMRI scanners. And so the implications are profound for that. Again, we're not trying to say we're doing causal, we're doing non-causal. And there's profound ethics with this. One question is, can you assume what someone's thinking? You can do that now, but we're not saying we're 99% accurate. So. The question is, how do we filter? Have you ever had a thought you didn't want to communicate to somebody but couldn't suppress it? <laughs> yeah, so we're going to need filters. Um, as I mentioned, the sex and violence filter people are working on, but you know, other filters, because you know, we don't want to be rude. Um, and then what do we do with the data? And we were talking um, in the green room before about Eleanor Osram and the work she did in land trust. She's the only woman that won the Nobel Prize in physics so far. And she really worked on, you know, as we think of having all of this data, how do we deal with it responsibly? Because what I think is going to happen is it's going to start with low resolution grainy and it's going to get better and then all of a sudden it's going to be really great. And then what did you sign away with your data before? Like what, you know, we've seen this movie before with social media now, maybe. So how do we get smart to that and talk about that now and form the right construct to how to deal with all of this data? Because we'll have lots more with success. Imagine we have way more medical imaging data than everything that exists to date in, you know, pick a number of years. Again, I think it's a single digit small. You might think it's longer. But how do we define the rules for this? How do we deal with trolls? Or is there an effective way? And why belong to this? And um, Eleanor Ostrom showed, like, when, if you, um, the con there was a, a famous paper called The Tragedy of Commons that was written that thought, like, you know, somebody could just buy extra cows and overgra overgraze the, the grass and there'd be no grass for anybody. And, or the use of water, but you know, the examples shown in, in Bali or in these small communities is that they actually had very good ways of handling it. And it's locally and, and talking. And I think this community might really help us figure out the right way to go about this. But it's our job to define what it means to be responsible before we ship a product, which is why we're talking about it here. Legal proceedings, of course. The answer is no. However, you, there's a book called I Know What You're Thinking, which shows how already how fMRI have been used to incarcerate people in various countries. Already. So, privacy, just a question. Do you think you'd be more private if you had an implant or if you could remove something? in the form of a wearable, should be obvious. So the apps, I'm just gonna go super quickly. Um, brain, body, can't separate. Um, a movie director, suppose you're a movie director and you wake up with an idea for a new scene that you were gonna shoot that day but you had a new idea. Could you just dump a rough cut of it directly from your head to your team and say, you know, I know we're gonna shoot that other thing. But this would be so much better, can we do it? It's a fast way to communicate visually for so many people. Enhanced social media is obviously another application for this as we think about really collecting 
setting our brain to rest mode. We know that that seems to be the cause of a lot of mental disease. People meditate, but is there an easier way to do that? And could we enable that? Dumping the words out of your brain without having to type or seems very easy just from the center of, um, the center of um, where the word center is in, in your brain. A lot of people ask me about gaming and digital therapeutics, and there's great work being done uh, on that. I think it might be a, um, an interim solution as we get to more of like, I don't know if we need the games anymore. I know, maybe that's controversial, but can you erase thoughts, bad memories? Maybe, but you know, you could do that now by zapping part of your brain, and there's some implications. If the brain, I mean, we do do deep brain stimulation already. Um, don't know. Brain after death. It's a lot easier to record while you're alive, <laughs> especially if you're looking at blood flow. But a lot of people ask me. We don't know. I, we don't know how to do that. But, but to share the joy of a memory would be pretty amazing to do with your grandkids or to capture that and share all of the emotion of it. This might be the biggest money maker of them all. <laughs> I think people would pay anything, and you know what? It doesn't have to be that good. Like, really, <laughs> to start, even just knowing they were, your, pet, your dog or cat was anxious or was hungry or wanted to walk, you know, it'd be pretty, didn't like that other dog, like that dog, you know, it'd be really helpful. <laughs> Sex and intimacy. I mean, right now, we stroke body parts and release oxytocin. What would happen if we could share the joy, the emotion, the vulnerability, and so forth? And do I need to go further? Maybe over drinks later, but you get the idea. I think this is inevitable. It's really inevitable because of what's happened in the trillion dollar manufacturing infrastructure, machine learning, and big data. I think it's inevitable. We hope that we are the company that enables it, but more importantly, we want it to happen, which is why we're talking about it, because it's important it happens. People are dying. So, you know, if you're a doubter still, do you really think having more data at higher resolution, at better temporal feature with read-write neurons will not give us um, more information to understand this, especially as we massively lower the cost and put it in a wearable rather than the most expensive rooms in hospitals. So, and again, it's inevitable because you could even say no brain-computer interface. We just can't deal with it. We can't deal with the ethics. But in the case of what we're doing, it's the same hardware layer that can see inside of our bodies and our brains. They're all biological. And so it's very hard to separate. And so my question to you, if you buy that argument, what can we do to shape it? Thank you. <clears throat> okay, we're all gonna just think about this for about an hour and then we'll talk. Okay. <laughs> um, one thing I didn't get, which is I sort of get how the brain reading part goes. How does the brain writing part go? We can neuromodulate with a focused ultrasound at a longer amount of time, and okay. that's very helpful for brain disease right now. But mm -hmm. we can also do that with neurons and change the state of neurons. And so that gets to the causality. We can write the state, certainly with optogenetics, which is mm -hmm. the tag of, a, uh, of an optically sensitive part where you're genetically changing your material, but even without genetically changing the material. Mm -hmm. the, the indicators that we have um, are that, well, there's, there's a lot of literature published that using infrared light alone, you can mm -hmm. stimulate neurons or inhibit neurons. Mm -hmm. And since we can focus that light non-invasively through skull and brain and focus it to the diameter of the neuron, mm -hmm. we're making the leap to say, we should be able to do this. So presumably the first applications of that kind of writing would be medical and what things come to mind, like Parkinson's or what? Sure, deep brain stimulation is used for Parkinson's, also mm -hmm. for essential tremor, other, mm -hmm. other brain disease mm -hmm. issues and mental disease, it's used there now and it's FDA approved. And then at the telepathy angle, as you're saying with the pet, it can be probably pretty low bandwidth and both sides will fake it. Uh, with humans, uh, 
Well, it's interesting. I'm suddenly thinking of Marshall McLuhan and the difference between cold and hot, and cool and hot, and he thought that sort of low band with people like to, uh, like girls with glasses, because the things are a little vaguer, and then you can build in uh, uh, whatever you want to see with uh, a little more vagueness in there. As this gets higher resolution, things are going to get awfully precise. Right. And you like that, and it's clear. Well, we, <laughs> I nearly died mm -hmm. as a graduate student in an Ivy League school mm -hmm. in the United States in 1995 because mm -hmm. an MRI was too expensive. I didn't know I needed one. I was pretty mm -hmm. entrepreneurial. I could have... Yeah. But, you know, people are dying mm -hmm. because they lack access to medical imaging. Yeah. The death rate, I was speaking to a family that runs a huge chain of hospitals in a mm -hmm. South American country who said the death rate due to cancer there is three times that of the United States. Mm -hmm. And they cite the cost of medical imaging as the number one reason for that. And so, yes, getting more resolution to see inside of our bodies and brains is interesting mm -hmm. and understanding how we work, and by the way, we're not the only thing with brains on the planet, seems an important endeavor for the living world, mm -hmm. but it's not without repercussion of how misuse could, could come. And it's interesting that resolution is both sort of spatial and pixels of getting down to the bandwidth of light, but also time. I remember when virtual reality first came along, if there was any lag at all, it was disgusting and you threw up. Right. But once the, the lag got down to, you probably can name the actual number of microseconds, then that was no longer an issue. Yes. So this closer and closer to real time seems like an important part of the resolution. Is that right? Yeah, it can be blurred. I mean, if we're using fMRI, it's over four seconds. And so mm -hmm. slow, like thinking of images. But like, how can you abstract the images that you're thinking of or mm -hmm. the, the music, obviously, which is very temporal. But you can, mm -hmm. you can think of it in terms of frequency space, mm -hmm. for example, and then be able to dump that, as has been shown. But... Um, we can dump visual images out of the brain and, and, and slow-mo movies with motion compensation and so forth. It's amazing as you start to build what you can do with That's algorithm development. But also we can get... Slow-mo movies is interesting because then you're talking about the change of pace that you can do in terms of reading the micro-movements and things like that. That really is a whole other level of information. As we develop these dictionaries yeah. of how we see, I mean... So much of the visual is back here in a certain area. We can go yeah. high res back there. Um, and then on the temporal, can we get the dip that's the sub second dip mm -hmm. before it takes uh, the whole... And you only have to go down a centimeter here. I mean, it's mm -hmm. like, it's so much easier. And that, it, from an mm -hmm. ultrasonic perspective, we can then do a tighter focus because... Mm -hmm the penetration of ultrasound is related to its frequency and the frequency is, sorry, inversely related to the focus size. So it's say 20 megahertz. You can mm -hmm. go down maybe two centimeters, but you can focus to a 20th of a millimeter. Sorry. And Question. you can pick up the light too. There. Yes, please. Uh, Micah Zwarowski asks, what do you think is the best path to become an early adopter of this technology? <laughs> Do they have to come work for you, or what happened? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're hiring. Um, every, we're hiring lots. But So we're making alpha kits for next summer as we figure out our go-to-market plan. Mm -hmm. And then the following year or two later, we'll be able to ship. And that's when we'll be able to support a lot more people. Because our first alpha kits uh, won't be products. We won't have finished the UI and the UX and the ID and all of that. We're really focused on the physics and the signal noise ratio and the depth and the scan speed and so forth. And so for early adapter, um, yeah, work with our company or one of the companies we're working with. Um, we're trying to figure out how to reach out to the community, but we're a small company and we're really focused. And so maybe someone else, maybe you have an idea. <laughs> come work with us. And you're working with these rats in the lab now. And say a little more about you know, what reading and eventually writing means working with these animals. What are you actually sort of getting? We're trying to um, exceed the resolution of MRI. 
okay. and prove that with a living animal mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we just made the pulse lasers so we can do living animals. Mm -hmm. So I took money from Brooke Byers early on, and this is relevant because mm -hmm. he made me make one promise to him. He found me, brought me into the, everybody's heard of Kleiner Perkins, but it's actually four letters, K, P, C, B. He's the B in Kleiner Perkins, and he came and got me into his office and says, look, I want to invest, and um, brought me a nice check, and he made me promise him one thing. I wouldn't experiment on myself or any of my employees. <laughs> Too bad I had already promised, right. <laughs> but I have. Right. So we're doing the animals. There's a lot of we'll volunteers are ready to like line up. I'm <laughs> sure of it. Can't do it. I promised Brooke. So okay, no smart of him, actually. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. So we're in the small animal facility, and then we we'll get mm -hmm. a thing from the FDA saying we're okay in humans. We we think it's perfectly safe. We'll prove it. Mm -hmm. And we just got the pul the strobe lasers mm -hmm. that enable us to do this on living things. So mm -hmm. we're just getting our first images on living things right now. Dowie. You describe this as a ski cap or a wearable or a bra or something like that. that say a little more about what's actually involved in wearing a thing which is going to um, get that kind of resolution out of the brain. So, well, one thing is the hair. And mm -hmm. so there's a small comb structure because the hair absorbs light, um, especially, okay, I'm just going to say it, anybody with dark hair, dark skin, we're testing that because black things absorb light mm -hmm. more than mm. white things. So you're easier, you've got less hair. Mm -hmm. um, I'm good, bring it it's on. It's an advantage. Well, uh, you know, it's a fashion, at least in males now, to have no hair at all. Yeah, so. exactly, so that's easy. No, but it'll work for everybody. So we've got this and you, you put it on and it, 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 the ultrasonic pings. We, so one thing I didn't explain is ultrasonic, um, ultrasound is a different speed mm -hmm. in bone as opposed to flesh and so it distorts. And so we correct for that distortion with other ultrasonic probes looking at that so we can focus. Hmm. And we focus the, the shape of that ultrasonic uh, probe around and we c pick it up with camera chips that are literally camera chips that are being made at more than a million units a day that go into the world's smartphones. The ultrasonic hmm. chips are going mainstream in the fabs now and we're making fiber lasers that are very typical. So we're using what Asia Inc. and the consumer electronic mm -hmm. supply chain is good for to make these subcomponents that enable us to make something low cost that can fit inside of a wearable. We, it can be a wand as well, and that might be better. I mean, mm -hmm. literally, if you're going to give something to a village. The wand is both projecting and reading, is that the idea? Yeah, mm -hmm. it can project and read, and that might be better in terms of hygiene rather than a wearable if you're going to share mm -hmm. it across people. Mm -hmm. What kind of power demand does all this have to do all that light and optics well, and sound? Well, it depends. So it's a modular system. Um, each of those disks I showed over the head represent an ultrasonic chip and a camera chip array, mm -hmm. a double stack camera chip array that has logic decoding in it, mm -hmm. and then a fiber optic coming in and, mm -hmm. a, and a light plate that brings in the reference beam to the camera chip. We can spread those out as many as we want. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the amount of depth and resolution and is related to how much light we can bring in. And mm -hmm. so we envision a small, medium, and large laser. So the right. large laser will draw more power than the mm -hmm. small laser. One place we want to get into immediately is triage, ambulance, urgent care. Right. Places that don't have the power plant. And so right, we right. definitely want to be in the size frame that can work in an ambulance. Is there, and, and power. Yeah, as well. that, what makes me wonder is, you know, there's the sort of the portable one, there's the ambulance one, and there's the one in the big expensive room in the hospital. Just the lasers it's, are different. Everything mm, else is the mm. same. And we, Asia Inc. likes to make lots of exactly the same things. So mm. that's why we just buy more camera mm. chips and more mm. ultrasonic parts. The laser, it's hard to gang up the lasers because of the, the very stringent requirements we have on, on the, um, what's called the coherence, which mm -hmm. sounds like a silly term, but it makes sure all the waves are exactly the same wavelength of light within mm -hmm. a few megahertz, which mm -hmm. is a, it's a, uh, like a thousandth of a nanometer kind, wow. of, kind of coherence. And so it's very hard to gang up the lasers like that. So right now our mm -hmm. approach is a small, medium, and large laser. Fair enough. And we have a really large laser that we've built that's, um, that's big. <laughs> 
but it allows us to experiment around and blast things and make sure we can see the limits of the physics. Mm -hmm. Is the descattering? I mean, you did holography early on, and that's a Fourier transform and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Descattering out, is that just a, a nice off the shelf kind of thing now, or has that got to be pushed a lot further? So the holography is enabled basically in the infrared mm. by, by two factors that have come into being literally for 3D scanning and for, for Pokemon Go and VR and AR. Mm. And that is, um, they sound scary, two terms quantum efficiency. Mm -hmm. which is light in, electrons out, was 7% in the near-infrared until this year. Mm -hmm. Now it's 70%, mostly because you can unlock your iPhone with a, rather than a picture of Stuart Brown, and now it has to be you, and you're measured at 940 nanometers, where you're back, there's this window between 700 and nan 900 nanometers, where you're a translucent blob of gelatinous blood and look like mm. a jellyfish, and then you're back opaque at 940. That's where your iPhone's working and unlocking your phone. And it's got this laser light it's sending out at 940. It doesn't blind you, it's low. But the camera chip is looking for the signal of that laser light mm. to catch the shape of your face, mm -hmm. which means it's looking for a little ripple on a sea of light in the room. And so what that is called is a deep quantum well and that's, that's also what we want, because we're looking for a little sea of ripples in the hologram that we're reco recording of the, the wavelength shifted light over mm -hmm. the, the huge sea of non-wavelength wavelength that shifted light. And so we can use, and most camera chips have red, green, and blue color filters on it. That doesn't work in the infrared, because no. no infrared gets to them. These small changes. So it's monochrome necessarily. It's a monochrome with a thicker silicon layer so it can catch the, with good efficiency, the longer wavelength of light. That costs whatever, call it a billion dollars to get mm. it everywhere. But it is everywhere and it's shipping at a million units a day mm. in the thing that the consumer electronics industry makes. And so I saw that and I'm like, you know, I. I loved Pokemon Go. I actually played it every day for a while, but you know, like Pokemon Go versus, you know, mm -hmm. transform medical imaging and a chance at telepathy. It was well, an easy choice. And that raises the question of the signal that's coming out of this, can you put on augmented reality sunglasses and see through your mice? Maybe, but like, why not just extract what they're thinking? Why not communicate visually directly <laughs> okay, with their... Right, right, do, right. Is the best display, actually, because I've made displays all these years. Mm -hmm. We don't want to have to wear anything. Can't we just zap each other these thoughts and images directly, like without covering our eyes? People don't like to have their eyes covered with anything That's other true. than what we're wearing. That's true. You're right about that. A uh, question from Nick at Long Now says, improved imaging of each other is great. This is what we're talking about. Better models allow us to focus on more nuanced things. Do you think that these models will ever be exhaustively complete? Do you, is there sort of levels of nuance beyond which there's no reason to go because you've got everything? How rich I think do these things want to get? I guess we don't know until we start to sample. It. There's always this analogy, right? Peeling the onion. You think, mm -hmm. oh, you know, just if I could only have one megahertz, right? Mm -hmm. Or whatever, you know, like, mm -hmm. but no, then that's not enough or whatever. Pick the amount of storage. And so there's always more things that you can do with a more capability. That's, I think, mm -hmm. how this town was built on the hardware side with Moore's Law and mm -hmm. everybody just more megahertz and more storage and so forth. And we'll figure out what to do with it. But you know, it, it's possible that, you know, mystery is good, mm -hmm. but, you know, that's what science is trying to do, is find out the unknown through successive approximation, and so mm -hmm. we're all interested in figuring it out and understanding more. So you've been in the thick for 30 years of the advance of all these technologies and all of these applications yeah. and so on, and as you're advancing this one, those will be moving along too, and how do you see sort of the, since you were looking ahead on what this particular technology has in the way of a short, a long, and a very long-term future. How about the whole array of things that it is part of, that is drawing on the trillion dollar industry and so on, which itself is having all these other applications. What's the range of applications that is emerging with this as part of it? For the range <clears throat> of applications of just in consumer electronics, I mean, it's become a monoculture. Mm -hmm. Really, like in 2008, 
the sky fell. I was living in Asia at the time, and um, you know, the companies I worked with that were living at negative 30, negative 40% margin. I don't mm. know if people remember that. I do really viscerally. It was very hard. I had taken millions of dollars from my friends to start a company. I had left MIT. Every day I woke up thinking, oh, I left MIT for doing to do this. It was very hard. Um, but what happened is one company executed very well, mm -hmm. Apple, mm -hmm. with its breakthrough product, the iPhone, followed by that iPad, and everyone else became fast follower. Ten years later, there's mm -hmm. no real differentiation. Everybody's got their candy bar phone. Mm -hmm. People aren't replacing it. And so what's next in consumer mm -hmm. electronics is, is a good question. So there's been all this money spent on VR and AR. Mm -hmm. It's not succeeding for lack of investment. Hmm. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many billion dollars? It's mm -hmm. a lot. I have some stronger opinions, maybe mm -hmm. privately I could share. But um, as, a, as a former Facebook and Google ex executive, I, I'm required to... Yeah, no, I'm just not going to go there. Um, so, yeah. So, um, we could do much better. But, you know, aren't there more interesting things we can think of to do with technology? And, and aren't they, you know, what... So, right, like, how do we fix up the, the fake news and this sort of um, mm -hmm. weaponization of social media, if you will, is one thing. But that's not long, long term. Long, long term is, you know, is, I think we, we both saw this quote from Joey this weekend. He's like, will we think of humanity in the future, like mankind now, like mm -hmm. totally discriminatory because there are all these other living things and why are we so focused on the humans, for God's sake? There's all of these other things that are living and don't they have rights? And I know I did that as I took the, the pig brain this weekend, yesterday, um, but they throw away the head. They kill the pig for, but like are we gonna, mm -hmm. you know, these are the sort of the questions of how we deal with living rights and the mm -hmm. environment, and, and can we get to the distant planets, and, and you know, what are we going to learn and understand and grow, and all the, all the, you know, why why live, right, mm -hmm. to learn and have interesting, exciting things to do, but mm -hmm. what are those? Um, we think this is part of it to be able to see inside of your body and brain at a thousand times cheaper, a billion times smaller, and a billion. It's, billion times mm -hmm. higher resolution, and because there's so many zeros there, we don't even have a business model yet, which gives us a lot of room. Mm -hmm. People are just happy for us to focus on the white-hot risk mm -hmm. of just making the thing, mm -hmm. and um, there's a lot, of, a lot of use for it. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I'm, I've sideswept your question. What is the answer? You've let, you're a big thinker. What is? <laughs> well, it probably relates to you in, uh, it relates to my next question, which is, you're an electrical engineer, you've been dealing with hardware and the software that drives the hardware for a long time. Now suddenly you're in meatware. You're, yeah. you're doing biology. Yeah. Uh, pretty thick. Now that's, most of the people I know from the so-called hard sciences, find it's a real jump to get into the biological sciences because it's such a mm -hmm. different world. It's a messy world, it's an evolved world, it's not an engineered world. It uh, seems to consist entirely of special cases. <laughs> and uh, you can't, you know, all this business of, of uh, reverse engineering the brain, it was never engineered, so there's no re reverse gear for that. What's that like for you to jump into that mud patch? Well, that happened to me in 1995 when I got a brain tumor. Ah. So I unwittingly, as a means of self-preservation, mm. uh, learned all I could about neuroscience and neuroendocrinology mm -hmm. just to, to survive. As I mentioned, I take a dozen medications every day since September 1995. Mm -hmm. If I miss them, I die. <laughs> so like, it's never far mm. from my thought and sort of investing time and effort into it. Made, made sense. So um, in terms of neuroscience, I've, I've read and widely and, and advocated. Also, very profound patient experience of mm -hmm. being inside. You know, I'm a doctor, but not that kind of doctor. So that mm -hmm. doesn't give you the power in the system and sort of figuring out how to get to um, outcomes that, I mean, I sort of basically engineered a better me. I mean, I like I actually like, um, mm -hmm. where I was saying I liked me that much before. And it's sort of interesting how you can change your 
brain through these, these chemicals that I take. And that's, I've sort of perfected that. I took like four or five years in the late 90s and, and really mm -hmm. did that and then tweak it every once in a while. So that suggests actually that the kind of tweaking you're talking about doing chemically basically now will become increasingly possible. Sort yeah. Of with I the think tools everybody that you're developing like, and we'll be tweaking our brains. Right, like I don't get jet lag because cortisol peaks in most people's bodies an hour yeah. before they wake up on whatever time zone they're at or whatever cycle. But not me, I don't make yeah. cortisol or adrenaline. Without it, I go into adrenal failure and die, but as a result, it's really great when you're working always halfway around the world and I was traveling. I literally right. went around the world every three weeks for like six years and mm -hmm. I could function really well in whatever time zone. And that, mm -hmm. that's very useful, if, for, although, you know, the environmental impact is... So we self-medicate our... Yeah. <laughs> we we self-medicate our brains all the time with caffeine, with alcohol, with these various things. Is this going to be a whole other mode of self-adjustment of uh, brain activity? I think, I think a lot of the medications for brain disease are that, sort of playing around with dopamine and serotonin and so mm -hmm. forth. But, you know, I, I, I was the only um, girl in the physics department at, at Brown, and I was the one that got, it was literally, it was a good kind of brain tumor, but a pituitary gland, and that just fast forward, that's the thing that makes your hormones. Neurotransmitters are a subclass of hormones. A action at a distance, you make like a dozen in your pituitary gland to the thousands in your body. Mm -hmm. And sort of learning about how to hack those was pretty fascinating. Mm -hmm. And how illegal it was to do at the time because even though I was missing my pituitary gland in 1995, it was illegal for me to replace the chemicals that my pituitary gland used to make mm -hmm. just in age and sex appropriate dose, doses, which I had a problem with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I found ways around it, which I can't really talk about that much, but a lot of them are now legal. And um, why was it illegal? I forget. Because it was too expensive. Ah. Like human growth hormone, for example. Mm -hmm. Totally legal for children at the time. It was illegal for adults. Still is in a lot of countries. Um, and and uh, that like it just it's just amazing how when you start to look at that and the feedback of it and do this sort of testing, which I did a lot of in the 90s, and still do a little bit, but I mean I, mm -hmm. I was doing it like every week because I was a mess. Like, and I just think like we actually can change. Like I think I'm like sort of engine. <laughs> like I don't know. Like. I, Maybe I've like was been, been really able to perform on the job because like I changed my neurochemistry and have been mm -hmm. very effective. So I'm sort of like I couldn't compete in the Olympics or whatever. But you know, like it's okay to get a like you know for being smart. Like you know, we don't have rules against how we hack ourselves for yeah. that, which is great. <laughs> but I'm kind of cheating, and maybe. <laughs> yeah, I can see self hacking is is got a whole new dimension so we have here. Um, kind of an interestingly specific question from uh, Clay, Claiborne uh, Deming says, I suffer from tinnitus. I oh, what's had from, it. Suffer from what? Tinnitus. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. In the ears. It's about. awful. Could you locate the source of the noise in my brain and shut it down, please? Maybe. Maybe we could Because it's famously neuron. incurable. You know, you got tinnitus. Famously, Sorry, just suicide deliberate. rates are huh? much higher because mm -hmm. it just drives you crazy over time. I mean, mm -hmm. the insidiousness of it, yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe um, uh, a friend of mine asked me if we could do that, and we're looking into it because it looks like we can read and write neurons. Can we pick out the right? But, like, that's FDA longer. So imaging mm -hmm. is one. When we start to sort of zap neurons, mm -hmm. we need to do clinical trials. And so mm -hmm. that's a longer frame for when we can ship something safely. For sure, yeah. Phases, but yeah. It, we seem to have the tools in the toolbox. And so putting that in the form of a product we can do, we're interested in getting something that's safe out there for, for triage and ambulance and urgent care as, mm -hmm. as, as fast as we can safely mm -hmm. so that we can build up the volume and then look at, look at the, 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 these. So beyond brain things, which we've mostly focused on, is where telepathy happens in cancer because of the questions of tumors and the blood flow and all that sort of thing. In other aspects of the body with this kind of visibility, what are other aspects beside cancer uh, of the body that might become of interest? 
This is something athletes will be able to tune up what they do. Sure. Internal bleeding, like is your diet changing your, um, uh -huh. the deposits in your, mm -hmm. your arteries, arteriosclerosis, mm -hmm. things with pregnancy, like the placenta is really in an organ that grows when you're pregnant and there's a lot of blood issues with pregnancy and we're really good at seeing blood. Mm. Um, there's also photodynamic therapy where we can, I didn't show it, but we can also focus the light back down, not just the sound. And that's the hottest area in biophotonics right now. Photodynamic therapy. Yeah, we're mostly cut and, and get deliver light. But if you deliver light to like a liver cancer or pancreatic cancer patient, you can lower the chemo doses by 25 fold wow. by adding light. And also there's this saying that Sunlight is the best disinfectant, right. but it's literally true. It's an antibiotic, and you can kill um, any kind of any kind of um, you know uh, what is that thing when you're like get the flu and influenza. You can kill it, not the flu. That's but like uh, sorry, I'm just trying to think of bacterial. Can you affect the inflammation directly? Pardon? Inflammation directly? Could you infect? It? Well, you're talking know. about you could go after infection, we not just on the surface, but deep inside. Sounds like. Yes, and non-invasively too. Mm -hmm. So right now what's being done with, non, with photodynamic therapy is bringing in you know, a fiber optic, cutting a slit, and moving it around in your liver, sorry, your liver or your wherever, mm -hmm. with inner organs. And then, then you can reduce um, these chemo doses or kill um, mm -hmm. different bacteria mm -hmm. without the antibiotics, especially antibiotic resistant. And so we could do that non-invasively by basically computing the inverse of the hologram, putting it on a liquid crystal display and mm -hmm. illuminating the light to focus it back down. And we've done that in our lab with these phantom tissues and the mm -hmm. meat that we've developed. And it does work. And we've, we've um, built the rudimentary um, parts of, of a new LCD, that en a liquid crystal display that enables us to do that. But since we have the focused ultrasound already, we're just trying to figure out what do we do to put together kind of a first rudimentary kit rather mm -hmm. than where, where, what we can do. But the key thing is like nothing in, in medical imaging and very few things in hospitals are made in the consumer electronics manufacturing infrastructure that's a monoculture from mm -hmm. the smartphones mm -hmm. and the recovery of the economic crisis. Mm -hmm. Healthcare has gotten super expensive. Oh, um, how do we democratize healthcare? There's not enough doctors in three mm -hmm. continents in the world. And we have doctors here saying, oh, you know, like radiologists are worried mm -hmm. about their job going away because the machine learning and AI is better. And I, mm -hmm. you know, the centaurs are supposed to be better. I, I have radiologists come up to me all the time telling me I'm taking their job. And I'm like, but what about the Hippocratic Oath? Um, yeah. <laughs> Do no harm if the AI is better. Are you harming the patient? There's not enough doctors. Can't you work on the corner cases? Because mm -hmm. an expert with an AI is, is, is much better. Mm -hmm. And can they look at the special cases globally? Because we are all connected now, at least with smartphones and, mm -hmm. and cellular network, if not, and 5G is coming, right? And so forth, some more bandwidth. Do we look at, at, at transforming medicine that way? And why is that so controversial? The other thing I also ask them is like, have you ever gotten a B in your entire life? You don't need to sleep, but stay up three days in a row. Like, I'm not worried about jobs for radiologists. I know I should be, but like, they're very smart, very capable, very driven mm -hmm. people who can help make people. Mm -hmm. Don't you? I mean. And when I see you coming with all your 10Xs and 100Xs and 1000Xs and you're proving this, the cost of medical care of various sorts has been going up and up. This should. Drop. Drop the whole goddamn thing. Right. Not just democratize toward everyone, right. but toward really affordable. But let's, and then make it up on volume to get mm -hmm. the motivation mm -hmm. for the businesses. Like, let's get great healthcare for everybody, right? Like, even if it's more than humanity, and there's more money to be made that way than just giving it to the rich people, perhaps. More healthcare for everybody. Thank you for doing Thank you. Thank you.